it is what it is. This is a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at verse 9. Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And Matthew rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a really interesting passage. I think I, think I preached on it on a Sunday last year, maybe. Uh, they don't let me into the pulpit very often. It, it just creates such a stir that I don't get in. They, it's okay. But the, the thing about it is that Jesus, first of all, were you taught by your parents, by your mother, your grandmother, somebody, you will be judged by the company you keep? Ah, yes, several know that one by heart. You will be judged by the company you keep. And here is Jesus being judged by the company he keeps. Uh, this is not the only time in the gospel that Jesus is in bad company. It gets so desperate at one time, his reputation is on such a decline and it's dragging the reputation of his whole family down with it that his mother and his whole family come and stand outside of a house where he is and say, the word comes in, uh, Jesus, your whole family is outside. They want to take you home. They think you've lost your mind. And he doesn't even go out. He just says, you know, my brother and my sister and my mother are the people who do the will of God. And he's looking at people right there around him who are waiting on him to teach them and show them what to do. You are judged by the company you keep. So here is Jesus in the company of tax collectors and sinners. I don't have to tell you how bad tax collectors were. They were equated in the law in Leviticus. Tax collectors, in the same breath as Leviticus says, don't keep, don't keep company with murderers. Push them out to the side. Let them have nothing to do with it, with the temple or you or anything. Tax collectors are in that same verse. And that's why they were such people on the edge of everything. And all kinds of other people on the edge came. It doesn't say who they are. Interestingly, it doesn't even say whose house this is in the gospel today. Could be Matthew's house. It could be Jesus' house where he invited them to come. Who knows? But wherever it was, it was filled up with all the wrong kind of people, looking for love in all the wrong places. And here they go, the Pharisees, talking behind Jesus' back. They don't talk to him directly very often. They say, you know, why does your master keep company with bad people? We know it sets him up for us being able to judge him, but why else does he do that? And then he says, Jesus says, he hears them. And he turns around and he says, I'm, I'm here as a doctor. I'm here for these sick people. You, you righteous people, he says with tongue in cheek, of course, because he knows they're not righteous. They think they are. He says, you don't need a physician. You're, you're fine the way you are. You've got the law down pat. But I'm here to take care of these people. I'm here as their doctor. What a wonderful thing. The doctor is right where he needs to be, and, it, and his opponents don't see it. And Jesus ends by saying something that rabbis used to say. They may still do that. But they say, they introduce a scripture passage that needs to be learned by saying, go and learn what this means. And 
following up on go and learn, Jesus quotes from Isaiah and says God's words from that prophecy of Isaiah, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Okay, now, fast forward ahead three chapters in Matthew. And Jesus and his disciples are hungry. They're walking along the road. This is in chapter 12. They're walking along the road, and they're going through a grain field, and they're picking grain and eating as they go. This is part of the law of hospitality in ancient Jewish life. Travelers who get hungry with food at hand were welcome to eat from the fields that they passed. No one was going to criticize them. No one would jump on them. It was the way things were. It was an understanding of who needed food and who could get it. No breaking of the law here. But Jesus and his disciples got hungry on the Sabbath day. And so the opponents, the Pharisees, this could be the same crowd. It doesn't, we don't know exactly where he was, where the field was. Maybe some of those people who were critical earlier of Matthew's dinner with Jesus could have been there again, and they say, why are you and your disciples, they said this right to Jesus this time, why are you and your disciples defiling the Sabbath? And Jesus says, oh, let me tell you, you have nothing to worry about here. You remember when David walked right into the temple, he and his men who were hungry and ate the bread of the presence, which was right there. They weren't supposed to do that. That was not a thing. That was not ordinary food. It was not to be done. And then he goes on and he says, you know, there's something better and bigger than the temple here right in front of you. He's speaking about himself. And then he says something really good. He says, if you had gone and learned the meaning of I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you'd understand all of this. He caught them not doing their homework. Your parents also may have told you something about the consequences of not doing your homework. He had essentially ordered them to go and learn what mercy and not sacrifice meant. They didn't do it. They weren't breaking the law. This time, you know, there's, there is no doubt that Matthew's house or Jesus' house were full of sinners. This time, these are just ordinary travelers. It's the band of disciples of Jesus, but ordinary people doing what the law permits, innocent as they could be of any wrong. And the Lord of the Sabbath says, you, you didn't learn your lesson. You don't get it yet. Maybe you will eventually. We're judged by the company we keep. And God's desire for mercy and sacrifice is a double refrain of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. He doesn't quote the Old Scripture, Old Testament Scriptures lightly. This was important to him to make sure we knew. And he's telling us, if we happen to think we fit the category of the righteous and the Pharisees, go and learn what I desire mercy and not sacrifice is. The actual language, the Greek language there, is powerful. It, it's not just I desire. It can almost be translated, I delight in mercy and not sacrifice. I delight in it. It delights the Lord to be merciful. And he's merciful to the righteous and to the unrighteous. If we think about how mercy and sacrifice are connected theologically in our minds, there are really three possibilities. It can be mercy, not sacrifice, mercy and sacrifice, or sacrifice and no mercy. I think everyone knows the scripture well enough to know that sacrifice and no mercy is not the way into the graceful life that God has in mind for all of us. But it's very easy to slip into an idea of your own unworthiness requiring more than just turning to God. 
that you can somehow add to your relationship with God by what you do. All of our good works come after being made righteous by Jesus. All of our good works follow on his act of grace in our lives. All of our good works have nothing to do with mercy. That comes free of charge. Free of charge to everyone. Even those that were pushed out to the edge by the old law. And the good works follow in out of gratitude and love of Jesus. And faith without those works, it, we know, is dead. But there is no such thing as God requiring of us mercy and sacrifice. It's mercy, not sacrifice. Amen.